Human Rights Forum welcomes you to the 11th Balgopal Memorial Meeting. We are glad to have you with us on this occasion. Our beloved Balgopal left us on this very day in 2009 and this is one way we try to continue his brilliant legacy. We would normally meet in Hyderabad every year on this occasion and have a couple of talks on issues of contemporary relevance. This year though we are doing this online for reasons you all know. Before we move on to this year's lecture, we would like to make an announcement about a new book in Telugu we have brought out on this occasion. The book is titled Antarjatiyam. It is a compilation of more than 50 essays written by Balgopal on various international issues, some of which include Palestine and Israel, the United Nations, issues in Pakistan and Sri Lanka and India's relationship with these nations the ideological and political changes in china and russia over the last few decades and obviously the vested interests of the united states of america in all these affairs given the extreme and perverted kind of patriotism that is being cultivated in these times by the dominant political interests in our country understanding how such politics played the decisive role in our historical relationship with the nations of the world becomes very important. This book, we hope, helps us in that regard. Since it's not easy to go to bookshops these days, we made this book available through Amazon. All of Human Rights Forum's previous publications in Telugu and English and documentation of our work are available on our now revamped website. We urge you all to check it out at humanrightsforum.org. The website balagopal.org contains a large corpus of Balgopal's writings in English and Telugu. It's an immensely valuable resource that anyone interested in the history of justice and its cultural dynamics will hugely benefit from. The subject of this year's Balagopal Memorial Lecture is the state of our republic. Many of us have been witnessing, for several years now, a relentless attack on the fragile democratic fabric of our society and the human rights of many. Targeting groups of people in the name of patriotism and religion has become the norm, so much so that sadly we don't find it shocking anymore. And anyone that questions this state of affairs is labeled anti-national and punished either legally or through public harassment or sometimes even just killed with impunity by the state and prosecuting agencies. To talk about these topics, we have Tista Satalwad with us today. For those that don't know about her, it's hard to describe Tista in just a few words. Tista Satalwad is a journalist, an activist and educationist working within and outside the law on a variety of human rights and constitutional issues. She is secretary of the Citizens for Justice and Peace and co-editor of the website sabrangindia.in. With unwavering and fearless commitment, she played a prominent role in the campaign for justice for the victims of the 2002 massacre of close to 2000 Muslims in the state of Gujarat. This work has resulted in obtaining convictions for well over 100 persons, including a serving minister in the Gujarat government, for participating in the riots. This work of hers has posed a threat to the then state government, particularly prominent politicians and law enforcement authorities in Gujarat. As a result, unsurprisingly, she has been at the receiving end of intimidation tactics and a vicious media campaign. We urge you all to look up her work, including her 2017 book, Foot Soldier of the Constitution, a memoir. We now move on to the Balgopal Memorial Lecture of this year on the State of Our Republic by Tisa Satalwat. Friends, Sathis, comrades in arms, we are meeting today 
uh, on a very very precious and important day uh, to commemorate uh, the memory uh, of, of, of a fine human rights practitioner, lawyer, math mathematician and civil rights activist, Keg Balagopal, left us too early on the night of 8th October 2009. But what a legacy he left behind. Uh, I mean, his, his analysis of structural inequality and violence, his ability to pierce through the most complex human rights situations and issues, his ability to interconnect the violations, be it in Jammu and Kashmir, Gujarat 2002, Andhra Pradesh, uh, Odisha, Uttar Pradesh, we miss him. We miss his uh, amazing analytical skills and also his intense and innate humanism. For us at Communism Combat and me personally, Tista Selvar, Balagopal was a dear friend and we remember him with a lot of fondness and a lot of regret. Thank you so much, Human Rights Forum, that was founded by K. Bala Gopal after he severely criticized the human rights violations within sections who worked for uh, the poor and the marginalized. Thank you, Human Rights Forum, for again inviting me on this very important day. The, the topic of my lecture, what I've been requested to speak on, is the state of the Indian Republic. And it is indeed is in a very sorry state. We still have our dear and valued constitution to give us the courage and the clarity to continue our battle. But we are seeing the constitution and we are seeing constitutional institutions hollowed out every day. Where do we begin and where do I begin? Yesterday we saw the travesty, the complete travesty of the uh, CBI court in Lucknow delivering the Babri verdict. 29 years after the open end, openly witnessed daylight demolition crime committed in broad daylight on Sunday, December 6, we are told that it was not a premeditated act, there was no criminal conspiracy and the accused will not be punished. I started my yesterday morning with a sense of foreboding because a sense of permanent dread seems to accompany most of us human rights practitioners over the last six and a half years. There was not really much hope that the verdict could go anywhere else. But when it came, I, the first thing I thought of is to talk to my colleague and fellow journalist and writer Ruchira Gupta, who was, who was not just eyewitness and on the uh, Ram Chabutra where L.K. Adwani, Murli Manohar Joshi, Uma Bharti, Swapandas Gupta and Chandan Mitra were standing and celebrating and egging the cook and egging the crowd on but she had the courage to in fact go inside when after the second dome uh, fell and was made to fall and demolished and there she was violently uh, attacked, molested, almost killed before she was rescued by somebody, a fellow traveller from Bihar. There's been worse last week friends we saw the most inhuman and ghastly gang rape and torture of, uh, of, of, of our young Indian, young Dalit woman at Hathras in Uttar Pradesh. And worse than the fact that the, there was a delayed uh, attempt to help her out health-wise and take her to AIMS Delhi by the administration, where she unfortunately passed away the day before yesterday. The worst thing is we woke up to the news on 30th September that her body, her bodily remains were not even given for dignified last rites to her family, which is not just a fundamental human right in national and international law, but is also something that is allows for emotional closure for a family. Even that was denied to this Valmiki family in Uttar Pradesh. Then we saw another such uh, rape in Balrampur and Aligarh, and it looks like the kind of ideology that is ruling India today in Delhi and in many of our states. Fortunately, they've been pushed back in some of our states. But the, 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 the ideology of a supremacist India, the ideology of overturning constitutional morality, constitutional law and the rule of law, appears to have given a complete go-ahead to those forces that espouse patriarchy, violence, casteism and blatant communalism, unequal citizenship. So I think I'd like to begin today because I think 
uh, which, a few days away from when the finally the lecture will be telecast in dedicating this uh, lecture in the name of K. Gala, Balagopal to those nameless and hundreds of victims of this bitter caste and communal violence that we are seeing particularly in the last six and a half years be it I, the young woman, our young sister in Hatras or Balrampur, be it Mohammed Clark, Mohsin Sheikh, Tabrez, Junaid, any of these names, we, we, we dedicate this lecture to you. We also dedicate a lecture to hope and the hope came from Bilkis Dadi and the countless, countless women and young Muslim men and women leaders from not just Shaheen Bagh, Jamia, uh, JNU, uh, Aligarh Muslim University, Lucknow, Hyderabad Central University, Muslim and non-Muslim, which young Indians have actually spoken truth to power, spoken truth to power fearlessly. And today it is very, very unfortunate that 22 of our young leaders are incarcerated by the Delhi police taking vicious advantage of the COVID-19 pandemic lockdown and using a draconian law, the UAPA, the, uh, the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, so that they are denied bail and they are incarcerated without fair hearing and without due process of law. We dedicate this lecture to them as well, be it uh, uh, Gulfishan, uh, Ishrat, uh, Umar Khalid, uh, Sharjil, any of them. The names are endless. We also dedicate it to 22 other lesser known uh, victims of the National Security Act in Uttar Pradesh. I mean, ordinary working class people, the rickshaw puller, the tailawala, who have been just incarcerated by the Adityanath administration and worse still, their properties are being attached in a completely illegal and unconstitutional fashion. So what are we seeing happen to the Indian Republic? What is happening? What kind of unraveling have been seen in front of our eyes over the last six and a half years? We are seeing, first of all, the application of unequal citizenship in various spheres. And the application of this unequal citizenship, which goes against Article 14, 21, 15, 16, 17, 25 to 30 of the Indian Constitution, the application of discriminatory <coughs> governance, <coughs> discriminatory law, <coughs> let's be very clear, stems from an ideology. Stem from, stems from an ideology that is ruling this country today. This ideology has captured power through democratic means. This ideology is not Indian or Hindu. I just want to make that very, very clear. This ideology is proto-fascist. It is the ideology espoused close to 100 years ago. It will be 100 years in 2024-2025 in 20, by the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh and the Hindu Mahasava. An ideology that has taken complete and utter inspiration, not from a more eclectic Hinduism, which was inclusive, but the most rigid form, because like V.R. Sarvakar said, that Hindutva is not a religion, it's a militarized state. So the RSS and Hindu Mahasabha have taken their inspiration from Mussolini's Italy and Hitler's Germany. So what we are seeing today, and let's be very, very clear about we are seeing today the hollowing out of the Indian Republic. We are seeing it because this ideology believes that to, to be able to transform, I mean, transform is their word, I would say completely kill the idea of the Indian Constitutional Republic and actually convert it into an autocratic, discriminatory, theocratic state, Hindutva, you would need to overturn the constitution. Now do you therefore need to amend it or can you hollow it out, have it there on paper, but actually the practitioners who are supposed to implement the rule of law which is laid down under the constitution, be it our police, be it our administration, be it the school structures, education structures, what we teach, what kind of history we teach, be it the judiciary, lower and higher, should be the bu buffer against this kind of incursion. Are these institutions caving and giving in? What about the election commission? The day the farmers protest was held on 25th September against three farmers bills that were rushed through parliament 
without adequate debate. That day was the day the election commission were coerced into declaring the Bihar elections in a very crude attempt to kind of divert electronic media attention away from a spectacular protest that took place in hundreds of locations where 150 to 200 farmer organizations joined and protested the complete hollowing out of the agrarian structure. No guarantee of minimum support price, no guarantee of procurement and we are being told that the farmer will be able to sell his or her produce to the open market. We've seen what the open market has done to this country since 1991. We'll come to that in a bit. But before that, I'd like to get into the fundamental thing that we as activists and practitioners and lawyers need to understand. That what do we do when the constitution remains there as an ideal for us, at least on paper, but those institutions that are meant to actually enforce the rule of law under the constitution are hollowed out by men, women and minds who actually believe in the overthrow of the constitution. The Rashi Swam Sevak Sang <coughs> says in its documents, read Bunch of Thoughts, read We Are a Nation Would Define, read Savarkar, says clearly that we believe fundamentally not in equal citizenship, but in unequal citizenship, where a tiny few are more equal than the rest of Indians and the others can be exploited in a more modern version of either Hitler's Germany, Mussolini's Italy, or the ancient Manusmriti, where you can actually have Thakur's degrade, torture, and rape a Dalit woman, like happened in Hatras. And then you can have possibly Thakur police officers completely giving a go by the law and not even give the body and the remains for a just cremation to the family. So if you have in our police, in our judiciary, in our school structures, in our teachers, in all these institutions of constitutional governance, election commission, actually people who believe not in the constitution values laid down by Baba Saheb Ambedkar, our reformers, our, uh, you know, from south and north, we had people who contributed to the constituent assembly debates. Uh, but you have people who actually believe that no, the constitution is not something that we need to have. We need to have something which is uh, iniquitous, discriminatory and structured. Can we still then have the complete hollowing out of the constitutional republic while the constitution remains in place? That's the harsh question for us. Let's not forget, friends, that the parliament, where there is a brute majority enjoyed by the RSS-driven BJP, the parliament today is being used to demolish constitutional morality and constitutional law brick by brick. Whether it is passing uh, fundamental changes to the law as money bills so that they don't need proper discussion, whether it is with the way the uh, farmers bills were passed, whether it is the bill the workers code, you are, you are taking away workers rights hard earned over 150 years. All, so the parliament is actually being used to, do, to thwart the will of the Indian people. Our preamble tells, tells us we the people of India the sovereignty of this country lies in its people. So, for instance, if there is a if there is a law, if there's a set of laws that are actually passed to overturn constitutional values, to actually, which are blatantly unconstitutional, which is happening in front of our, it happened in 2014, it's happening in 2019. When that happens, you can see that the parliament itself has been captured by this majoritarian ideology and parliament is being used to actually demolish our constitutional structure brick by brick. It happened on 5th of August 2019 when Article 370 was abrogated and our, our brethren, our sisters in Kashmir have been made to live with a completely undignified existence since then. Even before that things were very very bad. After the Buran uh, episode in 2016, we saw the kind of brutality of this regime. But following the abrogation, fundamental rights have been taken away from our sisters and brothers in Kashmir. So you see, the unique thing about this proto fascist regime, friends, is the assault is on multiple fronts. Multiple fronts. The assault is not simply, yeah, the, the, we have to also be clear that the RSS believes that there are three internal enemies of this nation, 
Muslims, Christians and communists and within communists you include the socialists, the dissenter, the farmer, the laborer, the trade unionist, the feminist, the free thinker, the creative person, the artist, the poet. I mean just let's even, even if we list a number of people, many Muslims who have been booked under Indian criminal law, even under sedition because they simply put up a post highly critical of either the chief minister uh, of Uttar Pradesh or the Prime Minister of the country or the Home Minister of the country. That list is endless. It's never happened in India before. Yes, we've had the emergency between 75 and 77 and I'd like to place on record that some of us here, me included, were active on the streets of Mumbai and other parts of the country when that emergency uh, was declared. We were just 16 and 17 years old, but we stepped out. We stepped out of the comfort of our homes and we did all we can to ensure that in the 77 elections, that regime was thrown out. So we did have that declared in emergency when political prisoners were held, when media was stifled, when the judiciary, when, when the first talk of a committed judiciary take, took place. That was a declared emergency, declared under law, which was questioned by one and all. Today we have an undeclared state of emergency, which makes it more difficult to tackle, more difficult to combat, because on the face of it, we are being told that everything is fine but you have virtually permanent permanent application of section 144 in all our cities and the new way in which this regime in this in the center and in many many states where it rules is actually uh, using a kind of emergency situations during the COVID-19 pandemic lockdown because this has proved to be providential for them they've tried to use the lockdown conditions to further oppress, pass unconstitutional laws, take steps, etc., which are completely without discussion, without debate, uh, etc. I'd like to come back first, now before I go anywhere else, to me, we'll be looking at many, many issues in my lecture, but I'd like to be come back first to December 9th and 11th, 2019. Very, very important days because uh, the ill-conceived and brazenly unconstitutional amendments to the Citizenship Amendment Act were pushed through, again, pushed through Parliament and uh, without debate, opposition kept asking uh, for uh, to be sent to the uh, Parliament, Joint Select Committee of Parliament so that amendments could be considered, etc. Nothing doing. Since 2016, when the bill was first tabled under the first Modi government, we were being told, we were being threatened that this kind of amendment is going to come, where for the first time in Indian law, the, uh, the, a discriminatory line on the basis of faith was being drawn. Former judges, jurists, activists, writers, all condemned this amendment of 2019 December as unconstitutional. And what did we see happen? on the streets. It was unbelievable. It was euphoric. It was unprecedented. We saw, we saw right from Delhi, after that completely inhuman, just and unlawful firing by the Delhi police, the same Delhi police that is today incarcerating young people and trying to change the entire narrative in the disgusting charge she's filed vis-a-vis -vis the 2020 violence. The same Delhi police behaved atrociously in Jamia Millia Islamia. I mean, a young, young, young student was blinded. Young students were fractured, lost their arms and legs. The library was completely uh, uh, trashed. This is the Delhi police behaving like a set of gundas. This happened on December 15th. I remember I was in Maligao at that time conducting a public meeting. And uh, I was conducting a public meeting simply on the threat of an All India CA and All India NPR and All India NRC. And the reason why my organization, Citizen for Justice and Peace, cjp.org.in, and uh, I have been called and my colleagues have been called for trainings all over the country after the uh, Citizenship Amendment Act 2019 and the threat of an All India NRC is because we've been working friends in Assam for the last three and a half years. And to understand what the process of a documentary test for citizenship can do, to the working class, to the marginalized, to the farmer, to the woman, to the Muslim, to the indigenous people, to the Adivasi, to the forest dweller. You have to understand what has happened in Assam. You have 3.2 crore population in the first list of the NRC, 1.2 crores, that is a third of the population was excluded December 2017. 
then you have then you have the next list that comes out in uh, July 2018 44 lakh people 44 lakh people are excluded and then you have the final list which comes on 31st August 2019 which tells us that 19 lakh people are excluded I mean any calculation that I've sat and done in terms of how, how the foreigner tribunal which are a dreaded uh, system of uh, unjust procedure uh, set up under a colonial law, uh, foreigner tribunal, high court, supreme court. Even 19 lakh cases navigating these tribunals will take 234 years. So it, the process is not just the punishment, this entire process is meant to permanently exclude the population from any participation in citizenship, which means government schemes, jobs, welfare schemes, Aadhaar card, PDS, etc. So you are, we are seeing in front of our eyes in Assam that a good 35% of its population is being incarcerated already. Do we want the same thing to happen in the rest of India? That's the question people started asking spontaneously. And that is why I was addressing this meeting in Malegaon at that time. And young students of Jamia Milia Islamia, they formed the Jamia Coordination Committee, they began their protest. And the firing, the firing that took place and the brute action that took place by the Delhi police is something that any civilized country, and I believe India is a civilized country, I believe that in the roots of the soil is a Shaman culture. The Shaman culture that has questioned Brahmins for centuries. But the, the, but the rulers today, coming from a Brahmanical, uh, fascist, communal elite, actually do not believe in the constitutional values embedded in this soil, not just by Ambedkar Phule, Savitri Bhai, Chotiba, Kabir, Basavanna, Narayan Guru, Nanak, Periyar. These are humanizing values that have actually sprung up on this soil for generations. So I'm not hopeless, but there are challenges. There are huge challenges on how we build up our alliances. How do we ensure that this innate humanism, the Shamana tradition that has always questioned the Brahmana, since early India, since early Indian civilization, comes to the fore and is able to tackle these brute forces. Come back to Jamia Milia Islamia and what happened December 15. And we saw the brute behavior of the Delhi police and we saw what happened there. And then we see a complete denial, but we see something amazing happening, something amazingly hopeful happening. That we see the community around Jamia, and we very rarely have seen this in India where an untutored community steps forward to save its young, to protect its young, just like a mother does to her child. And that's what Shahinbag was. That's what Shahinbag is. So if today on the Time magazine cover you have Bilkis Dadi along with Narendra Modi, it tells you a story. It tells you a story that there are two Indias, there are two Bharats. And these two Bharats are in clash with each other. And, 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 and may the better person win. So Shaheen Bagh came up, spontaneously. It came up and uh, I just want to say that I've been there a couple of times. I was lucky enough to be there on the night of 25th and 26th January as well. Republic Day was brought in that night. And it was an amazing energy. It was an amazingly humane energy. It was, it was, it was people like you and me, mothers, sisters, sitting there in protest, determined not to give up. The road, by the way, was always open. The propaganda around the fact that you were blocking the road was not true. <clears throat> what happens then with Shahinbag? Shahinbag inspires all of us. It inspires Hyderabad to have a 100,000 march against the Citizenship Amendment Bill, NPR, NRC, spontaneous, when many groups joining. It inspires Kerala. It inspires uh, Uttar Pradesh, Lucknow, Roshanbagh in Allahabad, it inspires Mumbai, it inspires so many protests all over the country. At August Kranti Medan on December 18th in Mumbai, we had an amazing protest, about 30, 40,000 people, unbelievable. Mumbai is a very apolitical city, but we had that protest. And there were a significant section of Muslims, but there were a large section of non Muslims as well. So I think. That was an important moment in India's history, the reclaiming of the Shaman. And then we see on January 5th, a brute state 
a proto-fascist state hit back. You saw the attack on JNU, the really brutal attack on JNU, where uh, young students were, uh, were brutalized. And of course, the ABVP women and men who led the attack have still not faced the long arm of the law. And uh, other senior activists from Delhi also reached there that night. Again, that 5th of January meant protests all over the country. In Bombay, we had one in Gateway, everywhere, everywhere, all over the country. The movement built up. The movement against the CAA, NPR, NRC built up. And I think the government of the day, the regime, was startled. They didn't know how to handle it. And therefore, they did what they best know how to do. That from about February onwards, January end February onwards, when the Trump visit was supposed to happen, and then the and the and the February, early February elections to Delhi state were taking place, all senior leaders of the Bharatiya Janata Party, Stoke RSS, including the Home Minister himself, including Anurag Thakur, including Kalpesh uh, Mishra, including Ragini, and a whole host of names used the opportunity of this Delhi election to spew hate and venom through hate speech against Shaheen Bagh, what it meant, why they're protesting. Atrocious language. And let's not forget this Home Minister is particularly good at atrocious language. He's used words like termites, etc. when talking in Bengal earlier, when he was talking about promises to the quote unquote Hindu social caste that we ensure that you come in through the uh, 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 N NPR, NRC, it's only one section that we are targeting, what termites. Now, you know, you use a word like termites, it's not just violent, it is culturally unacceptable in a place like India, which has always accepted people. I mean, we've had this tradition of accepting different cultures, different languages, different races, different nationalities. Oh, yeah, there may have been problems, conflicts or whatever, but there have been negotiations. Anyway. But a, but a modern-day proto-fascist, militarist ideology, which is not religious, which is not ancient, and which is certainly not Indian, has mastered hate speech, has mastered hate speech, and unfortunately, this hate speech polarizes us. It brings out the demon within us, and that's why I keep telling young people and communities that, yes, we have to tackle them, we have to file cases against them, and CJP is constantly filing cases against them against uh, television channels and individuals uh, on the question of hate speech. Yes, we need to get them prosecuted. But along with that, we need to side by side deal with the demon within us, the communal demon within us, the prejudicial demon within us that allows us to respond to this hate. Because that's what we saw in Delhi happen. That the election results came on February 11th. And uh, regardless of all these efforts, they didn't win. They didn't win. And I think that caused a huge amount of frustration huge, huge amount of frustration and then you see the frustration at losing the elections combined with this complete hate spewed against the protesters at Scheinberg and, and at least 10, 11 other locations including Koreji and uh, you know uh, Turkman Gate and Jafrabad, all these places in Delhi which were sitting on uh, you know peaceful, silent, non-disturbing protests. You suddenly see provocations by these, by these leaders. Consistent provocations. And then on the night of February 22nd, 23rd, soon after the most vicious speech made by uh, Kapil Mishra, not Kamlesh Mishra, Kapil Mishra, the most vicious speech, after that you see, after that you see violence breaking out in northeast Delhi. Now, some of us, I was not there, but we're watching it very closely from Mumbai and talk, talking to a lot of young people doing relief, very, very brave work. And we found, we found that in the first couple of days, two, three days, as often happens, there were anti-social elements from both communities who were taking advantage, okay? That, that cannot be denied. It's been mentioned in some of the independent reports as well. But soon after, on the third or fourth day, it became an all-out, full-blown pogrom against the poor working-class Muslims of Northeast Delhi. And it was shameful, it was horrendous, there was sexual molestation, gendered violence, burning of homes, <coughs> displacement, and over 55 people lost their lives. March 12th is a very important day. March 12th is a very important day because on this day, it is that the Home Minister makes a speech in Parliament and uh, actually tells the country and the world, which is why I say the Parliament is being dis uh, is used to dismantle 
constitutional democracy bit by bit. Uh, is the, is the, the Home Minister actually says that uh, tells us that uh, the chronology is clear. He said, first of all, he says Delhi police have done a great job. He doesn't condemn them for uh, Jamia. He doesn't condemn them for uh, a JNU attack. He doesn't condemn them for completely looking the other way when the Delhi violence broke out after February 22nd, 23rd. But he said they've actually done a very good job. He also says the chronology. And in that cr speech of Amit Shah in Parliament, we see the echo or the reflection of the final charge sheets that are now being filed by the Delhi police almost six or seven months later. So to cut a very, very crude and sad story short, I'd like to say that the Delhi violence, the Delhi police is under the Central Home Ministry. This has been an old battle from the Congress time, Sheila Dixit time, and they said the Delhi police should be under the state government like in different states, so that the central government cannot use it as a vehicle of power and political uh, push. But, but that's what the RSS BJP has done. And therefore, you have people incarcerated under normal criminal law where you have about 700 Muslims and we have 600 Hindus. But worst of all is that the COVID pandemic time has been used for these 22 UAPA cases to be filed against the youngsters that I mentioned, of which 19 are Muslims. So it's, it's a very sickening, discriminatory use of that law, whether it is uh, Umar Khalid, whether it is uh, anybody else. Now, what has happened in the last six and a half years is something that we need to really closely examine, uh, particularly if you look at uh, yesterday's verdict and what has also happened to this country since 1992-93. The slow poison, the slow hate, the legitimization of hate, and the complete constitutional position people actually spewing hate. So now we have a situation by which there is such a legitimization of hate that what Advani legitimized through his bloody Rath Yatra in the 80s and 90s, today is actually entrenched in the on parliament records. Par, I mean, just, just, just a four or five days back, you had a BJP parliament trailing abusing Graham Steins. And that, that's gone into parliamentary records. You've had Smithy and Irani abuse. You've had Sakshi. You had many, many central ministers use abusive language against Indian citizens who happen to be either Muslims or Christians or dissenters. So this is all now part of parliamentary record and therefore we are seeing, seeing post-truth or the end of history. One more thing I'd like to talk about the COVID pandemic like lockdown because that last seven months have been difficult for all of us, difficult for you, difficult for us, difficult for human rights practitioners. And how has the government and how has the uh, central government and the state government where the BJP RSS rules misused the agencies of the state during the COVID pandemic lockdown to curb fundamental freedoms, to curb protest, to actually pass private mining laws, to pass the labor code bills, to pass the three farmer bills, so that you just stymie debate, you just cut forward the debate and don't allow debate to happen. I think the, I have to, and I have to, and I have to talk about this, that there was a congregation of the Tablighi Jamaat in Delhi, Nizamuddin, mid-March, 12th or 13th of March. Now, for a congregation of something like the Tablighi Jamaat, I mean, I don't necessarily agree with the ideology of the Tablighi Jamaat. I find it backward looking. That's not the point. Religious congregations of many kinds in our country are backward looking, whether it is the Kewadiyas who march from UP to all over Delhi, causing huge civic disturbance, etc. But anyway, coming back to Tablighi Jamaat, there was this permission given to, uh, to uh, uh, this... Um, uh, Tablighi Jamaat in Delhi. Now, who gives this permission when such a large congregation of a few lakh, hundred thousand people is allowed to gather? It's the local administration and the local police. Local police is under Amit Shah, the Home Minister. Okay. We need to remember that. Now let's go to what happens. Suddenly you find after the declaration of the pandemic, lockdown, unthought of declaration of the lockdown by the Prime Minister, who did not even give time to our migrant worker families to make a dignified journey back to their homes and we need to say that apart from anything else that this this regime this proto fascist regime is anti-poor it's anti-worker it's anti-farmer it's anti-dalit it's anti-adivasi it's anti-forest dweller apart from being anti-minorities so you suddenly see even a channel like india today rahul kanwal and many many hindi channels using the tablighi jamaat episode to spew venom of the worst kind and this had an impact. It had an impact in Noida, in Greater Noida, in villages in UP, 
villages in uh, Himachal. You are a young man, Danish. Take his own life because suddenly the villagers around him started to say that you're a, you're a super spreader. You're a COVID spreader. You're from the Tabligh Jamaat because he had attended the congregation in Delhi. He just took his own life. So this phenomenon of journalism as genocide is also something that we are seeing in a very, very sharp and crude way in the last six and a half years. That it's not just the regime is acting. It's not that the regime is not just targeting some people. We were targeted. I was targeted in 2014-15 right in the beginning. Many others have been subsequently targeted. But while we are being targeted, the electronic media is a, is a vehicle of that targeting. That is a very important phenomenon. It's a Goebbelsian Go Go phenomenon. It's a Hitlerian phenomenon. It's a fascist phenomenon. That the electronic media is used to spin lies, spin tales, hate monger and actually create a sentiment among section of the public which makes it easier for those persons whether it's Umar Khalid who was shot at or Shaheen Bagh where the shooter went or anybody else to actually be uh, violently attacked. So actually you're seeing this phenomenon with electronic media channels who by the way are controlled by corporates and that's the other thing we need to know because the biggest abdication in today's India has been by the media. Media is not telling the story, is not looking truth to power. I'm talking about the electronic media as it should be doing. It is succumbing to the agenda of this proto-fascist establishment. The brave voices who have withstood this pressure and who report from the ground, who do your beat reporting, who reported on the mass migration of what? 10 million people? 15 million people? 20 million people? 100 million people? in those days of the lockdown, on foot, as a shameless government did not even give them transport at state cost. The figures of the Ministry of Indian Railways tells us that 10 million people got tramic trains to go back to their hometowns in the month of May 2020 alone, all at their own cost. Other migrant workers, and we've done a lot of relief uh, in, in Mumbai and around the surrounding regions in uh, March, April, May, June, Spent 7,000, 10,000, 40,000 for trucks, for lorries just to get back home. So not only did we desert, desert our migrant worker population, but we also decided that we will tell a lie to the Supreme Court. okay? And that's what the regime does very well. And therefore, when the matters came up in the Supreme Court, they were telling the Supreme Court that, you know, the journalists who actually reported on this are vultures. They're not doing their job, they're vultures. And the high courts that have given actual relief in the COVID pandemic time, they're running parallel governments. So this is the kind of language that is coming out of the establishment. And unfortunately, the higher courts are not being as uh, uh, critical of this and not setting things right as fast as they should be doing. And this is why we are saying that some of our institutions are being completely hollowed out. Our laws being used to stifle the constitution. I said so in the beginning that the UAPA is being used, the PSA is being used in Kashmir, the NSA is being used, the AFSWA is being used in Kashmir and Manipur. Now you will also have the Farmers Act, the Three Farmers Laws and the Labour Courts all being used against our own people. So the hard-earned rights that we've seen, uh, we struggle, we struggle for years to make constitutional uh, principles enter our laws. The Dowry Act was passed much later. The Scheduled Caste, Scheduled Tribes Act was actually actualized. It's not even really practiced properly even now, as we saw in the case of Hatras, where the body is not given for cremation, etc. But the laws were passed after a struggle of communities, even after independence, who say that you have to constitutionalize our laws. But now, the trend is reversed. You're not constitutionalizing our laws. We are trying to enact laws that actually destroy the constitution. When we talk about the use of uh, preventive detention, I need to have a special attention to Uttar Pradesh because Uttar Pradesh is probably one of the worst regimes uh, uh, currently uh, in terms of human rights violations, Dalit atrocities, anti-minority violence, sheer hatred and sheer communal poison that is being spread. Uh, just like you had protests everywhere else, you had protests in Uttar Pradesh when the CA 2019 was passed. And you've seen whether it is the Purvanchal East UP where Mao there are over 250 cases against people. In Lucknow there are cases like I mentioned against people. And worst of all, the Uttar Pradesh has come out with an ordinance that said that they are well within their rights on their own 
without any proof of accord to attach properties of anybody they wish to. So you're really seeing a colonial, draconian kind of period where the law is being used to completely destroy our fundamental institutions. I have so much to speak about. I'll speak a little bit now about the Adivasis and forest dwellers who are uh, uh, eight percent of India's population all over the country whom we also work very closely with and uh, many Adivasis when I do constitutional law trainings with them etc they tell me that you know we actually got independence not in uh, 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 in uh, 1947 or 50 when you keep saying constitution 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 but we got our uh, our uh, freedom in 2006 why do they say 2006 they say 2006 because uh, in 2006, the Forest Rights Act was passed. The, it's, it's a long name, but Forest Rights Act was passed. And this Forest Rights Act, uh, 2006, is, is, an, is a recognition of rights law. It's, it's the Schedule Cars, Tribes, Other Forest Dwellers, Recognition of Rights Act, 2006. It's rules that were passed in 2007 and 8. And the, the important thing about this law is, it's an all India law, and this law is being is, is the first time recognizes the historic injustice done to our Adivasi and forest dwelling people and, uh, and, and gives them the right through a very arduous process to stake individual and community claims to claim back lands that they've had, had even prior to the British so 200, 300 years and there's a very laid down procedure for this. Now what has the Modi government 1 and 2 done to completely nullify this law? First of all you got that atrocious eviction order from the Supreme Court uh, uh, in in uh, <coughs> February last year, and there was a huge pushback on that order, Arun Mishra's order, of February 2019, and then there was huge protests all over the country. So there was a stay within a week, and then we had 19 different individuals and organisations filing intervention applications in the Supreme Court. We were one of them. We are, of course, the fourth petitioner. First is Sukalo Gon, Nevada Rana, All India Union of Forest Working People, and CJP, and we are saying. That listen, we are the stakeholders. You can't talk about eviction when eviction doesn't exist in the, uh, exist under FRA at all. You have to understand that we are undergoing a process of claiming uh, community and land rights. And if there's any question that any environmental group like Wildlife First or something is talking about, talk to us and hear us first. The moment all of us intervened, <coughs> there's been a stay. Matter still in the Supreme Court. But what has Modi government done apart from not intervening? vociferously in that matter, they have passed four or five laws and I just like to uh, mention these. The Mines and Minerals Development Regulation Act, they passed this in 2015, the Kampa uh, Forestation Act 2016, National Waterways Act 2016 and the amended EIA, Environmental Impact Assessment 2020 for which there has been a lot of outrage. They have deliberately passed these various legislations to completely attack and dilute the hard-earned recognition of rights law, the FRA, that Adivasis and forest dwellers gave themselves in 2006. So we are seeing in multiple ways the law being used to destroy constitutional rights, people's rights and the constitution. I mentioned about how sections of the media are playing the game of the regime, but I also want to pay tribute to my amazingly brave fellow travelers in journalism who have lost their lives. India has gone down in the Press Freedom Index Many, many, 136 or 142 journalists have lost their lives under the Modi 1 and Modi 2 regimes. During the COVID pandemic, last six, seven months alone, over 1,000 journalists <coughs> have lost their jobs. And many of them have also contracted COVID. You know, we didn't understand. Some of us did. I mean, we are part of the union movement, even within journalism. Many journalists didn't understand when the contract system of uh, work came up among journalists the connection between independent journalism and permanent jobs. The moment you're on contract, you're vulnerable, then you don't want to stand up and uh, talk back to your editor or a news editor who says you have to do a story which is planned. The moment I know I'm protected by my job, I can take an independent stand, do my beat journalism and file my stories. So you see, neoliberalism, the proto-fascist attack, the transfer of <coughs> public resources to private capital, all of this is happening in a accelerated way under the Modi 1 and 2 regimes. Railways have been put almost completely decimated. We are seeing private players come in, which will mean that all the less accessible routes will not be available. Uh, fares will go up so much that the ordinary Indian worker, migrant labor, lower middle class, middle class will not be able to travel. 
and it will become just for the upper middle class and the super rich. What do we do about all of this? How do we counter all of this? Where is the resistance going to emerge from? The way I've been able to cope and my organization has been able to cope is first to not lose sight of the day-to-day -day struggle, to keep chipping away multiple ways, different struggles. And related to that is a historical understanding which I think some of us sometimes lack or we fall prey to the propaganda of the right wing. And I'd like to spend a few minutes on this. You know, often <coughs> super right wing guys tell us that constitutional values, right to freedom, right to life, right to life with dignity, are foreign concepts. I've done a little bit of work on this because I'm a passionate student of history and law and I really believe that's not true. You know, Yes, of course, uh, there was a certain modernizing uh, framework that Baba Saheb and the Constitutional Assembly, 299 members, were able to give to the Constitution uh, because uh, of the values thrown up by the French Revolution, the battle against slavery, Martin Luther King Sr. and Jr. in North America, worldwide struggles. Of course, that modernizing influence the hava of freedom blows and we get inspired. But a fundamental issue which I've been reading about and grappling with, and I really believe this to be true, and different historians look at it in different ways, but uh, I think there's so much material on this that we need to bring out, which is that, you know, the real battle for equality, non-discrimination, justice, gender equality, caste equality, inter-community, uh, toleration and dialogue has come from the soil, this large, large South Asian uh, subcontinental soil. So whether it was Buddha or Mahavir or whether it was Charvakas, uh, an atheist philosophy which, which you won't find in Brahmanical history books or whether Lokayat tradition or whether like I mentioned all our uh, seers and saints and dissenters whether it's Basavanna, Nara and Guru, Periyar. By the way, there are, there's a long list of Sufi and Bhakti women poets which people are researching on. So Mirabai's name we might know, but there is also uh, Jugra Bai and Sufi Bai, and there's so many others who've actually lived and spoken as single women in the societies of the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th century, and you know articulated their relationship with society and their maker in very equitous terms. In Kashmir, you have the uh, Lal, 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 uh, Lal Ded uh, myth, uh, Nuruddin and Lal Ded's mythical relationship where there are questions, there are answers, there are intimacies, there are um, serious philosophical questions about equality being raised. So I just want to tell friends and particularly younger friends that you know there is something in the soil which is always questioned, which is always resisted, which is always organized uh, maybe not enough, okay, maybe we lack organization enough, but we've always questioned, we've always been argumentative, we've always had the ability to see through uh, dictatorial tendencies and inequality. So that's what we need to recapture now today, regional histories, regionally inspirational heroines and heroes, stories, narratives, and, uh, and, and most of all build alive because I think uh, unless we are able to understand the intersectionalities of the attack, uh, yes, I think today the Indian Muslim is really sorely under the worst and bitter kind of attack. But so is the Dalit and uh, so is the migrant worker of a different kind and so is the fish worker who uh, mans our coast with the terrible coastal policy that the Modi government is employing. So fishermen and fisherwomen are losing their livelihoods and their cultural rights. And so is the Adivasi and forest dweller. So is there some way as movements and human rights groups we can work at building intersectionalities? And what I mean by interse intersectionalities is to be able to build lasting understanding and alliances among our migrant worker population. There are women, there are Dalits, there are OBCs, there are Muslims, there are Christians. Among our farmers, you have the same denominations as well. Among our forest dwellers and Adivasis, you have Van Gujars, who are both Hindu Van Gujar and Muslim Van Gujar. I mean, fish workers, you have the Christians in the south, you have the Muslims in Malabar, you have Maharashtrian Hindus in Maharashtra and Karwar, etc. So is it not possible to somehow build intersectionalities? 
our unions need to look at this issue our uh, farmer organizations need to look at this issue the unorganized sector organizations need to look at this issue but we cannot compromise on tackling of othering and hate if these intersectionalities have to be lasting have to endure propaganda which is coming every day in vicious whatsapp groups from the other side vicious whatsapp groups from the other side where half truths and myths are being fed to us and my inner demon feels satisfied so i fall prey to that myth half truth we need to be able to have the strength to tackle hate that has to be foregrounded in our agenda we cannot allow our muslim brothers and sisters to become the butt of othering we cannot allow our dalit sisters and brothers to be the butt of othering hate and violence we cannot allow the lynchings to take place the rapes to take place the violence to take place we need to reclaim our public spaces together with understanding with empathy and knowing that our history has been one where the shaman has questioned the brahman and has always been oppressed back but i think the victory eventually has to lie with the shaman and if if we believe in somebody like pala gopal who with his absolutely sharp and in-depth understanding of structural inequality i mean his his uh, his his elucidation on the death penalty is surpassed by none uh, and and who the death penalty is given to and how uh, i think we need to uh, really spend some time in uh, building these deeper understandings and translating these deeper understandings into collective action long term collective collective action where 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 hate propaganda needs to be dispelled within the family within the mohalla within the society within caste within unions within farmer organizations within women's organizations everywhere our lawyers have a huge role to play because we need to fight this battle in the courts and beyond as well independent journalists have a huge role to play and young people most of all who've proved to this country that they can be the opposition when the real opposition caves in they have a role to play and i'm sure they'll play it thank you so much friends for having me on in this uh, on this very very precious and important day for me both emotionally and ideologically thank you so much good luck bye bye